Good to see everyone this morning. Uh, We're going to continue in our sermon series that we started last week. So if you want to turn your scriptures to the book of Genesis, very beginning, uh, that's where we're going to start. And uh, of course, uh, last week we talked about the significance of the scripture and how uh, the God of the Bible cannot be truly known Uh, in terms of all his characteristics and attributes and his deeds apart from the word of scripture. Now we can kind of look around and see the beauty and the majesty of this world in which we live. We look out into the universe and, you know, stand in awe of its wonders and its glory. But if you're going to know God, you're going to have to find that information from the Bible. When I was in high school, uh, a good friend of mine, in, in a, on a physics test one day, uh, answered a question that our uh, teacher had uh, put forth, and uh, it was a very convoluted and nonsensical answer. It was one of those where he twisted words all around because he didn't know the answer to the question. Now, he was very intelligent, and, and uh, it's just one of those things he didn't happen to know the answer to, but he was smart enough to kind of... Uh, you know, stretch the truth or, or bend it in such a way as to create the uh, the appearance on behalf of the teacher that he really knew what he was talking about. And she figured, well, as smart as he is, he must know what he's talking about, even though I don't. And so I'm going to go ahead and give him credit for it. He actually had no clue what he was talking about, and it really didn't make any sense. But some topics or ideas or concepts are so difficult to explain that we tend, if we're not careful, to bluff our way through them. I don't really know much about that, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. You've heard me talk about, I mentioned a fellow by the name of Howard Cosell, he used to uh, be a sports uh, caster and announcer, and they used to say of Howard Cosell that he could talk about any subject for at least four hours. And if he knew anything about it, he could talk about it for eight hours. Um, but some topics are like that, and the topic before us today I find to be like that to some extent, and that is we're going to talk about God today. Um, his existence, his essence, his nature, all those things have been debated for years. And practically every culture, as we mentioned last week, has some uh, idea of, uh, uh, of a God uh, that they worship. Uh, as we mentioned in my Sunday school class this morning, everything from deism to monotheism to polytheism to pantheism and panentheism and all these other isms. And so... There's just a whole plethora of information out there, but we have to be very uh, discerning in being able to figure out exactly what information we're given is that's actually uh, that is accurate. The God of the Bible is the God that we uh, know and worship and and follow, and uh, for anyone to be able to fully explain, I mean fully explain. Uh, or uh, to comprehend, before you explain, to comprehend or to, to explain this God of the Bible would be like a newborn infant explaining nuclear fission. Uh, and I confess to you my own inadequacies in this regard. I mean, I know what I read and I know what I know, but but I, I think about just a, a, a little pea brain trying to get all the, the the wealth of this universe concerning the God who created it inside our heads, it just is not going to happen. But the only way that we can have the slightest bit of information that's, that's accurate uh, about this God is to find it on the pages of Scripture. That's, that's just the way it works. And so we're going to do that uh, this morning, hopefully, as we look at uh, this, the, just the idea of God. Now, we want to be, I'm going to do this with a series of questions, and I begin with this question. How does the Bible introduce God to its readers? Well, that's a very important question because, you know, there's a whole lot of discussion, as I mentioned, relative to this, uh, the understanding of God. But the Bible does something very interesting. Uh, we talked about the big questions last week, some of the big questions of life of uh, who made all this and how do we get here and uh, why are we here, those kind of things. And are we here by chance or is it by design? Um, we assume a designer. The book of Hebrews in chapter 3 and verse 4 says, For every house is built by someone, and the builder of everything is God. 
Uh, that's just, I just I don't know how you get past that when you start talking about how we got here. I uh, saw this week where I guess some astrophysicists or some uh, some uh, uh, people with uh, in, involved in space exploration and search they're starting a one excuse me a two billion dollar project to look out, go out into space and look out into it and see if they can determine the origins of the universe. Now, I'm a nice guy. I'm willing to save them half. If they'll call me, I'll tell them how the universe got here and they can save a billion dollars and uh, we won't, oh, any of us will happen, won't have to work, worry about money ever again. They can pay me half and I'll tell them the answer and then we'll, we'll go from there. But isn't that interesting? Now, how does the book of Genesis do that? That's where we're starting. How does the book of Genesis start with our understanding of God? And it begins with these four words. And we'll talk about more in this book in the, in the oncoming weeks. But in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. The audience that would be reading this would be Jewish theists. They understood that that. There is this God that has made everything, and as they read this, they're saying, we're, we're having our information confirmed for us in the beginning God. It is a foundational assumption uh, of the Jewish faith and the subsequent faith of Christianity of Christians that we begin with God. It assumes God's existence, doesn't try to prove it, doesn't go through some kind of... Uh, Mental gymnastics where you're saying, okay, you, you know, think about this and think about this and how this could have happened and all that. Doesn't do any of that. It just starts off with those basic four words, in the beginning, God. And uh, I believe you could literally preach on those four words forever and never exhaust it. Never. Now, Moses, we believe to be the writer of Genesis, and he's writing in retrospect after God has completed the creation. But he's also writing from Revelation. God, uh, what God told him to say these things, not something that he guessed or surmised or something that was, that was just merely passed along to him. Hebrews 11.3 says, By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. God spoke all these things into existence. And so... We look at this and we say, well, how do we know? How do we know in the beginning God? Well, we know that because there are only two possibilities. Now, I know that when you start talking about this, people want to say, well, uh, the chances of there being a God like, like we believe in as Christians, the chance of there being a God like that is one in I don't know how many billion. And that's true. The alternative is that we got here by chance and and even those who propose or who, who advance, uh, advance that idea recognize also that the chances are like one in no, no telling how many billions that, that an accident happened that put us here. But look, there's only two options. We were either created or we're an accident. So it's 50-50 if you're just talking about numbers because we're here. If we weren't here, then you could start talking about all those chances, one in a billion or 10 billion or whatever. But since we're here, it's one out of two. And the issue is then, which of these two do you have the most evidence for? And uh, that becomes a problem for a lot of folks because they don't really want to follow the evidence. But we know that in the beginning, God, because there's only two possibilities, and also because of everything that follows, it's like overwhelming volumes of circumstantial evidence that proves for, you know, for any reasonable thinking person that God was in the beginning and subsequently created everything. It's like a residual or hidden DNA left at the scene of, of, of some kind of event. And what follows, the universe and all that's in it and everything that's happened since, only could occur if, in the beginning, God. Now, today, they tell you to follow the science. Well, science tells us we got here by accident. So they tell you to follow science. Well, actually, what I think what they're talking about is to follow the science fiction, not to follow the science. What kind of reader does the Bible presume? Well, there's 
it follows a, a wide variety. First, we say, well, the Bible presumes a faith reader. Someone who has faith reads the Bible, and that's true. One who believes, one who wishes to increase his or her faith by more learning. Because that's what Paul tells us in Romans ten seventeen. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And so the more the word of God we hear, the greater our faith. And that, that's a logical progression that makes tremendous sense. But it also, the Bible is also read by lots of skeptical readers, one who disbelieves and one, one who doubts. And people on the, on, the, on the line from one end to the other, all those in between, all the spectrum of unbelief to belief, from seekers to saints, people read the Bible. And, and uh, you know, it would seem to me that... Uh, once you have what the background that we had last week from our, from our lesson, once we understand what the Bible is and, and how it was given to us and everything, when we start with those first four words in the Bible, then, then we ought to be hooked in the beginning God. And, and look at all the stuff that's happened afterwards. And when you read the Bible, you find out how all those things came into being and what they mean subsequent to their being here. It's just so significant. So the Bible introduces God to its readers in a very forthright and direct way by just saying, in the beginning, God. Now, what kind of God does the Bible present to us? Now, I know that you, you know, it's going to take a long, if you, you'd have to read the entire Bible and talk about it all the way through to get a, a, a complete picture. And I just want to just give you a quick synopsis, one that you already know, uh, that reveals this this. Early edition God, if you will, the book God from Genesis, the first, first three chapters, how it, how it uh, you know, informs us about this God. The Bible tells us that God created the heavens and the earth, and, and subsequent to that, all the things that are on this earth, and then he created human beings, man and woman in his likeness, put them in a garden, told them not to, uh, you know, to eat of all kinds of fruit except this one particular tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The Bible says that man's adversary, the serpent, who was indwelt by Satan, came along and tempted Adam and Eve to disobey God, which they subsequently did. And then uh, man lost his position, his standing with God. And so when you look at this, you say, well, was this just, just kind of some kind of uh, 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 experiment that went horribly wrong? This was, I mean, this was God's, this is what God was hoping to accomplish, but it didn't work out that way. And so everything just, you know, just blew up. And, uh, you know, God did good, man did evil, end of story. But this story tells us more about God than we sometimes realize. It tells us some obvious things. It tells us that, that this God was a present God. That, he, af, that after creating uh, Adam and Eve, he actually spent time with them. Now, I won't go into all that right now. We'll come back to it a little bit later. But he was a present God. He was also a powerful God. No God, no one could could do this were it not for his great power. God, the Bible says God spoke the universe into existence. Now, uh, you know, we, we start, uh, talk sometimes about people who have persuasive ability. They can tell, say something and persuade people uh, or, or situations to, to change or, or to do something, or you do what they, whatever they want done. But think about that. Think about what kind of powerful speech was involved when, when the creator of the universe says, come into existence, and it did. Now, that's persuasive speech. That's, that's, that's really, really out there, something that we can't get our head around, basically. He is pe- present. He's powerful. He's creative. I don't know that we give God enough credit for his creativity uh, that we ought to, uh, we look at, at various things and we stand in awe of them from time to time, but we ought to be in awe much uh, more often than we are. One of my favorite things to do, and I've talked about it uh, often since, since Janice and I, I've always done this, but since we've been here, I've really appreciated being in this area at night and being able to look up at, at the sky and the stars here. I mean, because we don't have a lot of, of uh, uh, the light diffusion, you know, uh, that, that messes things up. You can actually see up into the, the vastness of space. It's such a wonderful thing to see, the creativity of God that's displayed there. So those are some obvious things, his presence, his power, and his creative ability. But there's lots of subtle things in this creation account that tells us things about God that we couldn't know any other way. One of those things is that it was good. 
Now, God said often when, you know, when he created all the various things over the period of six days, he said, it's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. Only a good God could make good things. And of course, when he finished up, he crowned that, uh, that uh, uh, creation account with, uh, with man and woman. And he said, it's very good. Man, it doesn't get any better than this. Because now I have someone on that earth to reflect my glory. Someone who's made in my image. God was a personal God. Not just a present God now, but a personal God. The Bible tells us that he, he, he apparently walked and talked with Adam and Eve. And the, Bible, and, and the Bible continues to suggest in a different way that he does that with us as well. He's a personal God. The Bible says, even in this early account, he is a loving God. That's why he created us in the first place. He created humankind and and loves us. You see, here's the deal about love. There's no such thing as love that does not have an object of its affection. How can can you love when there there is nothing to love? And so... 1 John chapter 4 verse 8 tells us uh, that God is what? Love. And so for God to be able to demonstrate that love, he had to have an object of his affection. And while he obviously cares about his entire creation, the crowning achievement of that creation takes preeminence. He loves us. He loves us. If God is love, his love must have an object. That's why Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 6, verse 26, Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, yet the heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Absolutely we are. You see, God loved, loved his creation, his creatures so much that he, he tried to protect them from sin and death. That's the reason that he gave Adam and Eve the command not to eat of the tree of good and evil. You know... Always we should think about God's commandments as his protection and not as his forbiddance, as some kind of punishment. And I'm afraid that's how a lot of people understand God and read the Bible. God is just a mean old bully that doesn't want us to have any fun. When in actuality, God is a loving God who's trying to make certain that we enjoy life to its, to its uttermost for as long as we possibly can. His commands are for protection. This little section, Genesis 1 through 3, also tells us that a God is a just God because he punished Adam and Eve for their disobedience. He's not going to let that slide and let us not think that that while we might have just done a little something wrong, that God's going to let that slide either. We're going to pay in some way. There's always going to be some kind of punishment for sin. It might not be eternal punishment, if we've accepted Christ, but he, we're going to pay in some way. But notice, notice even after God punished Adam and Eve by sending them out of the garden, the Bible tells us that he proved to be merciful by giving them a second chance. Many years ago, there was a preacher on television by the name of Gerald Mann. I'm not sure, certain, but I think he might have been a Methodist. I don't, I don't really know. But he was uh, preached at a church in Alabama. And he came on on Saturday evenings. And I loved listening to this guy. Every one of his sermons had the same theme. Now, the sermon was different every week. But the, but the theme was the same. I, I marveled that he was able to do that. I mean, it was, just, it was the same story every week. And it's the most important story for, uh, for any person who's looking at... Uh, uh, having their life changed. And here's, here's, here's the byline. You can begin again. Isn't that true? You can begin again. No, no matter how bad you, 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 a person's been, no matter what he or she has done, no, what, no matter you know, how many things uh, that uh, one has against them, you can begin again. And look, look. No one could have been more guilty of sin and a a more terrible sin than Adam and Eve. And if God can be merciful towards them, he certainly can give mercy toward us. And not only is God uh, uh, this just and merciful God, as we see, he is a promissory God. He planned for the deliverance of the human race even after it was a fallen race. 
Genesis 3, 15 and 16, the Bible says, uh, God said, I'm going to put enmity between you and the serpent. And you're, he's going to bruise your heel, but, but uh, his head's going to be squashed. He's a promissory God. He planned for our deliverance. So let's look at the third question. What kind of response? What kind of response does the God of the, the Bible expect from us? Now, I'm not talking about plan of salvation here per se, but what kind of response to that? I think there are three things that, uh, three re- ways he wants us to respond. First of all, I think he wants us to respond intellectually. Uh, you, you've got to be a pretty smart being to create all that God has created. And he created us in his image with the ability to think in a way that no other creature has. We'll talk about that later on. But he wants us to connect with him in an intellectual way. Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. Now, when we talk about this kind of faith, we're not talking about blind allegiance. That's not faith at all. That's just stupidity. He's not saying that we should walk, you know, go off uh, in all directions, you know, because we think that's a, you know, that's a, a, a display in great faith. No, great faith comes from belief of testimony that has been given. Belief is always based on the evidence of testimony. C.S. Lewis, when he was writing in his great work, Mere Christianity, uh, as Lewis had been an atheist and he became a Christian and he, he, as he was writing, he said, I'm not asking anyone to accept Christianity if his best reasoning tells him that the weight of evidence is against it. What he wanted to see people do was lay the evidence down and take a look at it. And that's what God wants. God wants an intellectual relationship with us because he wants us to examine these things. Most people, or many people, have not examined any evidence relative to what the Scripture says about the existence of God and what, how he did all these things. They decided against belief and refused to look, uh, to uh, even try to refute the evidence, that, the overwhelming evidence that he did what he did. Regarding the existence of the universe, they begin with the premise, there is no God. Now how do we get here? You see, belief in God is not a mindless leap. Into the unknown. God wouldn't want that. That would be ignorance or superstition. Uh, You might even call it religious insurance. A lot of people, Joe was talking about fire insurance a while ago. Uh, A lot of people, well, I'm going to believe just in case. Don't really believe, but I'm just going to make certain, you know, I want to get all my bases covered just in case. That's not the point. Adam and Eve had interesting faith in God, didn't they? They They had knowledge of God. He was right there with them. And when, when all this happened to them, their faith was at a crossroads. They had to decide from that point forward if they could really, you know, they, they learned the hard way that they could trust God, but they had to decide right then what, what the rest of their lives were going to be like. Um, many of us, if not most of us, here's the way we think. We often choose what we want to be true. Not what the evidence tells us. And that's why the people, are trying, people try so hard to discredit the whole idea that there is, is a God. We, want, we, we don't want there to be one, so we, we, uh, we ignore the evidence. God wants an intellectual relationship with us. God wants a, a relational relationship with us. Adam and Eve had this daily encounters, perhaps, most likely. But God had to abandon per, his personal contact with Adam and Eve because of their sin. Have you ever thought, thought about that? Our sin would, would cost us a relationship with someone else. Maybe that's happened to you in some, on some level. Your sin or the other person's sin has cost us cost a relationship, and that's exactly what happened. But what does God's, what the words say about all this? God still wants that. 1 John chapter 1, verse 3. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Psalm 34, 14. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and save those, saves those who are crushed in spirit. 
Paul speaking to those on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17, verse 27, says God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each of you. God wants a relationship. He is a relational God. God expects a behavioral response from us as well. Leviticus eleven forty four and 45 is repeated for us as a quote in 1 Peter. So I'm just going to read the 1 Peter one. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 and 15. Peter writes, Therefore, prepare your minds for actions. action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given to you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires when you, uh, you had when you lived in ig- ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy... So be holy in all you do, for it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. That's Leviticus 11 quote. You see, the word holy means set apart or different. God is unique. And and what he wants from us is unique representatives of himself scattered all around the world. And those of us who have responded to his love, grace, and mercy, who live for the cause of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, we're doing our very best to be that, aren't we? You know, Satan lied to Adam and Eve in the garden by telling them, God knows that the day you eat of the fruit, you'll be like him. Actually, it was just the opposite. It It was disobeying God that tarnished the image of God that was stamped on them. But through Jesus Christ, we now have the opportunity again. That's the beauty of this whole story that's laid out for us in the Bible. We had uh, scripture this morning in, in the service that Richard read for us from Exodus. And I think that scripture kind of lays out in, in some of the most concise way, perhaps the most concise way, the dis- wonderful description of this God that, that we've been called to serve. I'm going to read it again as we close. Remember, uh, Moses has been hidden in the cleft of the rock so God can, can pass by him and, and uh, Moses wouldn't see his face. But in those verses, here's what we read. And he, that is God, passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, Slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. That's the kind of God we have. We have that kind of God. But he balances that, unfortunately for a lot of people. He balances that with these words. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the the children and their their children for the sins of the father to the third and fourth generation. And there is, obviously, you know, from our perspective, as we understand, read and understand the scripture, there is no doubt of the existence of this being who has created us in his own image and has left evidence of that, you know, footprints, DNA, what, fingerprints, whatever you want to call it, all over this universe for us to consider. And the crowning achievement, at least in his way of thinking, was of all the things he created, the most important and the most significant was you and me, humanity. And he did everything within his power, including sending Jesus to die for our sins, to make certain that we would never, ever miss that relational experience that we can have with him. And if you're here today and you've never responded to the love, grace, and mercy of Jesus, we encourage you and we invite you to do that. But most of us I know in here have. I'm hoping that as we're going through these these messages, that we're gleaning enough that when people have these kinds of questions that we encounter on a continuing basis, many of us daily, that we'll be able to give an answer to people when they ask the reason for the hope that's in us. We're going to stand and sing a hymn decision. If you have a decision to make today, we encourage and we invite you to do so. Let's stand together.